Hi, I'm Fran Spielman, and with me in the Sun-Times newsroom this morning is Troy LaRavier, president of the Chicago Principals and Administrators Association and one of 20 or so candidates for mayor of Chicago. Welcome. Thanks. The first declared candidate for mayor of Chicago. I know, and that's not such a good thing because, you know, the, the original candidates are kind of getting short shrift now, and now that Rahm is out. Uh, How do you break through that? Well, you get on the ballot, number one. Uh, and so we're out circulating our petitions, uh, gathering signatures to ensure, because all 20 people are not going to make the ballot. And so we have to make sure that we're one of them. Uh, and two is get a message out that is clearly different uh, and focused on root causes. I don't see anyone out there with that kind of message. You know, our core message right now is that we, you know, we are set up. Every single institution, public institution that's been supposed to serve the people is being set up for failure. Our schools are set up for failure by being understaffed. Our revenue streams uh, have been set up for failure by being diverted toward the mayor's campaign donors and the campaign donors of the mayor before him. And so our campaign, our goal is to upset the setup, to bring in policies, bold solutions that actually address root causes, the root causes of the so-called failures of our system. They've been, they've been set up to fail. All right, and so I don't see anyone else in this race who is not part of the system and the string of politicians who are a part of that setup. How is Tony Preckwinkle part of the system? So Tony Preckwinkle, number one, was a part of the city council that voted for every single one of those city budgets that delayed or deferred pension payments in order to pay for the mayor's, at that time, uh, dailies, pet projects. Uh, Tony Preckwinkle is the head of the Democratic Party that runs the city. Tony Preckwinkle, when it was discovered by the Chicago Tribune and front page story after front page story after front page story that Joe Barrios and his office was over assessing the property values of poor people and then under assessing the property values of the wealthy and therefore having the wealthy pay less taxes than they were supposed to and poor people making up for the taxes wealthy people didn't pay that he presided over and orchestrated this system. Tony Preckwinkle, after several front page stories about this, refused uh, to lay off her support for him. She continued to back him. She continued to support and endorse him, even though it was clear that he was shortchanging poor people, working people, and particularly people of color in this city. So her loyalty her loyalty to the Democratic Party is stronger than her loyalty to the people of Chicago. And it's that kind, that system, that Democratic Party system that got us into the mess that we're in, and she's going to continue to remain loyal to it. I mean, she's no Rahm Emanuel, let me be clear. Um, but we need You something. think she's a more. reformer in sheep's clothing? I mean, she, she has a progressive record. Uh, she champions that. She talks about jail population reduction, bail reform, all these things. And yet you say she's beholden to who? I just said she's beholden to the Democratic Party. When she was alderman, she was beholden to Mayor Daley. Um, when we talk about progressive, we have to be clear about what we mean because there are people, Rahm Emanuel can claim to support some progressive policies. He is for, he's supportive of gay marriage. For example, that's a progressive raising policy. the minimum wage to thirteen. Right? Well, that's not. He wasn't. He wasn't in support of raising the minimum. His support of raising the minimum wage to, to, he was to thirteen. Into, yeah. His support of raising the minimum wage to thirteen dollars an hour was to prevent the minimum wage to being 15. raised to fifteen dollars okay. an hour. So he did not support a raise in the minimum wage. He wanted to All right, but cut he's, that he, out. He's a lame duck now. What about Preckwinkle? I mean, you got to. You have to. To have a chance, slow down the Tony train. She's trying to make it look inevitable. So that inevitable. was my, that was the point I was getting to with the Rahm Emanuel piece. That even people like him can claim some progressive stances on a couple issues, particularly social issues, because progressive stances on social issues don't cost anything. They don't cost their wealthy campaign. It doesn't cost their wealthy campaign donors to be supportive of an end to cash bail. It doesn't support, it doesn't cost anything for their wealthy campaign donors for them to support um, gay marriage. But when it comes to 
progressive revenue, when it comes to taxing, uh, for example, a progressive tax on real estate transfers in this city. We're not going to see that from Tony Preckwinkle. We're not going to see it from anybody who's part of the mainstream Democratic Party because wealthy real estate developers are their main campaign donors. We need people in office who are going to support a full progressive platform, just not, not highlight a couple of socially progressive stances they may have while their economic stances are not much different than Donald Trump's and then try to pretend like they're progressives. And I see Tony Preckwinkle as one of those people. All right, so what is your plan? The next mayor is going to be hit with a $1 billion, B, billion dollar hit increase in pension payments. What is your plan? You don't like the way the mayor has raised taxes by $2 billion already. What would you do differently? And so let's remember the debate, at the, la about the debate about this during the last election. When this question was asked of both candidates in the runoff, uh, the mayor said he supported a, a progressive state income tax in order to help deal with this. He said he supported using TIF funds in order to help deal with this. He said he supported raising or expanding the sales tax to include services in right. order to deal with this. But what happened when he was elected? He didn't lift a finger to push the state to raise uh, or to um, have a progressive revenue or rep okay. progressive right, income tax. But he's tax. old but, news now. Let's talk but about let's, your let's plan. Make this, but the people of this city have to see this from a historical, that's the problem. We don't look historically. We keep moving on and moving on and we keep letting people pull the wool over eyes. I'm going to take this time to remind people not to let the wool be pulled over their eyes right. again. And so when he became mayor, he didn't lift a finger for a progressive income tax. He didn't lift a finger to expand the sales tax or casino, none of those things. He went straight for our property taxes and for regressive revenue. So what I'm saying is that I also support each one of those things. But unlike this mayor, I'm going to use my capital, capital as political capital, as mayor of Chicago, to push for a progressive income tax at the state level, to push for an expansion of the sales tax, to push for uh, taxes that he would not support what? and that Tony Preckwinkle would not support in terms of taxes on downtown businesses. Things like the um, uh, LaSalle Street tax or uh, the tax on financial, financial transactions, transactions. Which exactly. is prohibited by state and federal law. That's why I said push for it. There's things that we can pass and there's things that we can push for. We don't even get people in political office who will even push for them. They go straight for our property taxes. And property taxes certainly can't be taken off the table. But what I can promise the, the taxpayers of the city of Chicago is that I at, will use my capital as mayor of Chicago to push for every single one of those so that if we have to put property taxes on the table, the tax increase will be far less under my administration than it will under anyone else's administration because I'm actually going to push for alternative sources of revenue. What taxes that would you do that you could impose at the local level without anybody else's approval? And so the, 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 the Metropolitan Planning Council has proposed a, a real estate transfer tax uh, on properties over a certain amount. And so if we propose, if we institute those kinds of taxes and we institute them in a way that properties over a certain value are targeted, then that is naturally a progressive source of revenue. And that's the other thing. So in now, other words, the more the, the uh, transaction is, the more you would pay. Exactly. And who would pay, the seller or the buyer? Both. Both the seller and the buyer would yeah. pay and it would be higher based on? Based on the value of the sale. And that's not currently right. the way it is now? No. It is just a flat per transaction? So, so the, the, right, right, right now it doesn't, right, right yes, that's, that, that's, that's the way it is right now. But what, what we, want a, we, want, we want something that's more progressive and we want to actually increase the amount. Okay. By how much do you? By, by whatever, so this tax will be created along with several others. So it's like, depending on what we get from other sources of revenue, that's what 
whatever the leftover need is, is what we're going to need to increase the tax bond. And so we can't give a specific amount right now because this has to be calculated along with whether or not we get state income, a state income tax. This has to be calculated along with whether or not we're able to have the LaSalle Street tax. It has to be calculated along with all these other sources of revenue. But the point is, that is a source of revenue that neither of the opponents, the major opponents that are in the race right now, are even considering, let alone thinking about a specific amount. The argument against a LaSalle Street tax, in addition to being prohibited by state and federal law, is that the exchanges don't need to be here on LaSalle Street. They could leave. Right? I've heard that argument. And you don't I buy it? I obviously don't buy it. Why don't you buy it? Because Chicago is a major um, source of income. It is a major um, site for business transactions. Chicago has 2.7 million people. Nobody's going to leave 2.7 million people behind. Uh, Chicago has an infrastructure that is unlike any other, uh, the infrastructure available in any other city within hundreds of miles. You just don't pick up and leave Chicago. Uh, so I don't believe it. Now you have a plan, not a thousand more cops, 10,000 teachers. Yes. What do you mean by that? So Chicago Public Schools right now is the most understaffed school district in the state of Illinois. So that's where we start. The average Illinois school with 600 kids has 59 staff members to serve those 600 kids. The average Chicago Public School with 600 kids has just 37 staff members to serve those 600 kids. And so that's 22 missing staff members. That's 22 fewer than the average, not 22 fewer than the top Illinois schools. Chicago public school students have 22 fewer staff to serve them than the average Illinois school. That includes and teachers so and support teachers, staff. Teachers, that support staff, that's psychologists, that's counselors, that's case, that's case workers, people to help deal with mental trauma, music teachers, painting, sculpture, all of the things that other kids throughout the state get to be exposed to, small class sizes. Our kids don't get because we have 22 missing staff members. And so my plan says, and it's not, shouldn't be controversial at all, 22 additional staff members in every Chicago public school on average. And if you total that, total that up, it's about 10,000 new teachers and staff members and support staff across the city. Are you saying that the sh Chicago does not, with all its crime, and all the fear that we see now, need more police officers? So this is what I'm saying. We, if we take a look at how we're using our police officers right now, it makes absolutely no sense. Uh, if you go to, uh, I, think it was a, I think it was either in your, your paper or maybe the trip, they did an analysis of bicycling tickets. And the Austin community got hit with 397 bicycling tickets while in Lincoln Park, they got five. Now, I've been to Lincoln Park, and I've ridden my bike in Lincoln Park, and I know people violate the speed, the ride through the red lights just as much as anyone else. And I've been to Austin, and you barely see a bike in Austin. I don't even know how they found 397 people to give bicycling tickets to in Austin, and yet policing resources were used to target communities, to target Austin and dozens of communities across Chicago, just like Austin, as using the police as this oppressive force to extort revenue from poor people of color. That's not how policing resources should be used. Well, but the that's bait not- truck, The bait truck incident, police man hours were used to set up that bait truck. And so we need to think in a revolutionary way about how we're using police resources. We had, what was it that weekend? 76 people shot, 12 of them murdered, $1.5 billion police budget, zero arrests. 76 people shot, 12 of them murdered, $1.5 billion police budget, zero arrests. We're not using our police resources. We have to build our investigative capacity. They talk that about, means more detective. That costs money. Well, that, that, that means training people to do, that means training people to do detective work. That's what that means. It so doesn't you, mean um, 
increasing the size of the force. It means training people to do detective work.